from what I said in Behind the Curve, because of the way the producer twisted that around, you took that and interpreted it as the Earth was spinning, right? The problem is, I was not saying 15 degrees per hour of Earth rotation. I didn't do the initial test, but I got credited with that, so I'm just going to wear it. We took that gyroscope, and like I said, when we first plugged it in, we got a 15 degree per hour rotation. And actually, it wasn't specifically 15 degrees per hour. It would be an interpolated value taking the sine of the latitude times 15 degrees per hour, which would kind of equate out to that. When I was in the movie, yeah, at that time when I stated that, you know, I was as surprised as anybody else. And yeah, I was very reluctant to accept it because I was trying to interpret exactly what we were seeing. I came to find out later on, and by the way, I did tell the movie producer this, what we were seeing had actually been measured and discovered over a hundred years before in what was called the Michelson-Gale experiment, the rotation of the luminiferous ether. At that point, we had the challenge of, well, how do we prove that it is not Earth rotation and was in fact the luminiferous ether? Now, some people don't believe necessarily that the new luminiferous ether exists, but there's also a lot of Nobel laureate physicists that say that it does. There's a big debate on it, let's just put it that way. We actually devised a way to tell us us whether or not it was in fact earth rotating and it was really pretty simple fiber optic gyro works on something that's called the sanyak effect and the sanyak effect goes under the assumption that if light is traveling through a medium they speak of light as a wave you have to ask yourself what is a wave what is it waving what is it traveling through to cause that wave what is the medium that light is actually waving scientists have been saying for centuries that it is in fact this luminiferous ether and that is what i actually wound up claiming that it was that was actually rotating the luminiferous ether. Now here's how and why I came to that conclusion. So we went back and we looked at these experiments from over 100 years ago and the assertions about the Sanyak effect and laser interferometry. And it turns out that what they say about the luminiferous ether is that it behaves very much like a magnetic toroidal field. The ether very much behaves in the same way. It actually is moving. It's not a stationary thing. It is moving and believe it or not, it propagates vortexually. And it just so happens that that vortex rate is about 15 degrees per hour. How is it that we were able to figure that out and that it was not Earth rotation? The answer is really quite simple. This is, by the way, exactly what we did. We took the fiber optic gyro and we went to a place in Colorado called Pikes Peak. And Pikes Peak is at 14,125 feet above sea level. And we did our measurements there and we got essentially our equivalent to the 15 degrees per hour rotation rate from from Pikes Peak. And then we went directly east in Colorado on the exact same line of latitude down to just over 4,000 feet. And then we did another measurement. If I am measuring spin or a rotational rate, it should not matter whether I take that rotation rate at the bottom of a device or at the top of a device, especially a, a spinning ball. It would be the same whether you took it right on the globe or an inch above the globe. It would not vary at all because it doesn't matter where you would be, high or low on that same latitude line, it is going to rotate at precisely the same speed. Here's the problem with that. What we found was that when we did the measurement with the fiber optic gyro at the 4,000 foot elevation, we had about a 1.3, 1.4 degree per hour variance from that done at the 14,125 foot elevation on Pikes Peak. So we thought, well, that's pretty interesting because that actually equates to be 26, 27 degrees per day. That's a huge number. So we did it again at a different place, Guanella Pass, and again, and again, and again. And we did it in several different places in Colorado. Each time we then went to its corresponding latitude line at a lower altitude. And every single time we got a greater than one degree barrier on the two measurements. Well, why would that be? Well, if you think back to what I just said about how the luminiferous ether was always said to propagate, and this comes from the people that coined the term, you know, Newton, Maxwell, all these people that talked about this originally, all you have to do basically is visualize it as a vortex, i.e. like a tornado. If you are looking at a tornado and you look at it on a z-axis, at the top of the tornado, it's rotating fairly slowly. And as you go down that z-axis down towards the ground, it rotates fast faster and faster and faster. So you have a considerably faster rotation rate at the ground that you do from high up in the air. That again is exactly what we are saying that the luminiferous behavior is propagating as a vortex. The problem here for the globe is 
is when you get a 1.3, 1.4 degree per hour, which equates to 27, 28 degrees per day, something like that, difference in rotation, then that pretty much tells you unequivocally that what we are picking up is not Earth rotation. And it is more commensurate with that vortexual behavior that science has always told us that the luminiferous ether actually behaves in, in this vortex. We did this multiple times and every single time. You know, we weren't expecting such a huge variance. When you're talking 1.3, 1.4 degrees per hour, that's actually huge for 10,000 feet. We can only imagine that that number grows even greater if we were able to go higher and lower. But the most important thing is what it proved unequivocally is that what we were picking up was not Earth rotation. That's it. Whether or not anybody wants to accept that it was in fact the luminiferous ether, as I claim and as other people claim, that's up to you. But the primary goal here is to prove that what it did pick up was not Earth rotation. And in fact, when they did this over 100 years ago in the Mickelson Gale experiment, they had to do another experiment called Aries Failure to try and determine what exactly it was that was spinning. Was it the Earth or was it the sky? They devised a very simple optical experiment called Aries Failure, in which they measured the rotation rate optically with the telescope, and then they filled it full of water, and theoretically that would slow down the propagation of light through the telescope. And then the idea was if they had to tilt the telescope further forward, then the light would not be coming in at the correct angle. However, if they didn't have to tilt the telescope forward, then the light was already coming in at the correct angle of 15 degrees per hour, indicating that it is in fact the stars that are rotating and not the Earth. Guess what? Aries failure same conclusion. It concluded that it was in fact the star. So now not only do we have the FE cores version of, you know, testing whether or not it was Earth rotation, but we also have Aries failure from back in antiquity. And to this day, you still have people saying, well, we built these gigantic laser interferometers that are stationary and sitting in one place. And of course, they are going to be picking up a rotation just like we did. But the problem is there's no way to falsify that if you cannot move that detector up and down on a z-axis to see if whatever it is that you're measuring is changing velocities at different altitudes or different z-axis. So that is how we know unequivocally that what we were not measuring was Earth rotation. And of course, because the producers of Behind the Curve did not want that information to come out, they skewed it and made it look like, wow, dummy flat earthers, they proved it with their own equipment and then sit there and keep denying it. Well, they didn't include the rest of the story and that's kind of the problem that we have with Behind the Curve. I have told this countless times, it doesn't get any press. The producer even said it himself. They were all for giving Behind the Curve a fair representation until they went to the 2017 Flat Earth International Conference in Raleigh, North Carolina. Then at some point, a either primary or junior high school kid got up, expressed his beliefs in Flat Earth, and Clark, Mr. Clark, that did the documentary production, said that he and Caroline decided at that point in time that this was too serious and they had to stop it. And they decided at that point in time that they then had to change around the theme of the movie to make it more of an anti-Flat Earth propagation piece. Now, they said this in their own words. Daniel Clark, by the way, is his his name. He said it in his own words, and he said the same thing to us. It's like, okay, now this isn't funny anymore. You've got kids taking this in, thinking that it's serious, and so now we're going to turn this around on you, and that's why they didn't include it. That's exactly what they told me, and that's what they are actually in public saying. In other words, this flat earth idea, this paradigm is so powerful that it will change lives. It will change everything about this world, really, that you ever thought you knew about it. And it exposes a lot of things to a lot of people that they simply are not ready to handle yet. And so that is why they decided not to do that. And they, that's exactly what they told us. You're very welcome.